Good afternoon. <laughs> Fantastic. So my name is Talitha Washington. I am the president of the Association for Women in Mathematics. And we're in for a great treat today. Um, so first, let me start off by just reminding us that we can measure the impact of an educator and mathematical leader by the excellence and morale of her colleagues and by the number of students who have undertaken successful careers in mathematics and in fields requiring mathematics. The Association for Women in Mathematics and the Mathematical Association of America annually present the Etta Zuber Faulkner Lecture to honor women who have made distinguished contributions to the mathematical sciences or mathematics education. While the lectures began back in MathFest 1996, the Etta Zuber Faulkner Lecture was established in 2004 in memory of Faulkner's profound vision and accomplishments in enhancing the movement of minorities and women in scientific careers. Dr. Etta Faulkner was born in Tupelo, Mississippi and attended public schools there. She then attended Fisk University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, graduating summa cum laude with a major in mathematics and a minor in chemistry. She was also inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. At Fisk, she was inspired by her mathematics professor, Dr. Evelyn Boyne Granville, who was the second African-American woman to earn a PhD in mathematics back in 1949. This past June, Dr. Granville passed on and gave us her gift of mathematical excellence that was passed on to Dr. Faulkner, who has passed on that same gift to many, including myself. I'm a student of Dr. Faulkner. Immediately, follow, immediately following graduation from college, Dr. Faulkner attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where she earned a master's degree in mathematics in 1954. In the words of Dr. Faulkner, can you imagine what it was like for a 19-year-old black female from Tupelo, Mississippi, who had been immersed in segregation for all of her life to attend the University of Wisconsin? I underwent a major culture shock. She then returned to the South and began her teaching career in 1954 at Okalona Junior College in Mississippi. In 1965, she began her career, uh, I'll say, at Spelman College, my alma mater, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, rising from the position of instructor to a named full professor. While she was early on as faculty member at Spelman, she earned a PhD in mathematics from Emory University, and in 1969, she became the 11th African-American woman to earn a PhD in mathematics. At Spelman, she served a myriad of roles, including chair of the mathematics department, chair of the division of natural sciences, the Fuller E. Calloway professor of mathematics, director of science programs and policy, and associate provost for science programs and policy. In 1965, Dr. Faulkner herself was the winner of AWM's Hay Award. Dr. Faulkner was a visionary whose entire career was dedicated to the advancement of women in STEM and is recognized by her peers in the profession as being one of the most influential and respected leaders in the mathematics and sciences. Dr. Faulkner passed away in 2002 and her positive impact lives on through us all and is radiated through the great work of Dr. Tatiana Toro the 2023 AWM MAA at a Faulkner Lecture. Dr. Tatiana Toro is widely recognized for her contributions to mathematics. Her primary research interest lies at the interface of partial differential equations, harmonic analysis, and geometric measure theory. She received her bachelor's in mathematics from Universidad Nacional de Colombia, Bogota, and earned her master's and PhD in mathematics from Stanford University, under the supervision of Leon Simon. She was a visiting member at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, a Murray Jr. Assistant Professor at University of California at Berkeley, and an Assistant Professor at the University of Chicago. She has spent much of her career at the University of Washington, where she serves as a Professor of Mathematics. She is also currently serving as the Director of the Simons Lawford Mathematical Sciences Institute in Berkeley, California. So it, she, AWM has a deck, it's called Even Quads. You can get a copy over there in the uh, 
exhibit hall, if you so choose, and Tatiana Toro is on, featured on one of the cards and in deck one. And it reads, Toro's research bridges geometric analysis and the calculus of variations on one side and harmonic analysis and geometry of measures on the other. In particular, she is a leading expert in using ideas rooted in the calculus of variations to study the regularity of problems which do not have an underlying energy variational structure. Dr. Torrell's awards and honors are, I think, endless. These include the Sloan Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, Simons Foundation Fellowship. She was also invited session speaker to the International Congress of Mathematics in India. She is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Academia Colombiana de Ciencias Exactas, Físicas y Naturales. She is the recipient of the 2020 Blackwell Tapia Prize and the 2019 Landolt Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award from the University of Washington. And her work has been continuously supported by NSF since 1994. She has served on the Board of Trustees at IPAM, the Board of Directors for the uh, PIMS, the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and currently serves on the boards of BIRS, B-I-R-S. Uh, she has mentored many mathematicians, including eight PhD students and six postdocs. And she was recently awarded the Marsha L. Landolt Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award. And her mentees speak highly of her support and her care in crafting mentor-mentee relationships built on a balance of challenge and trust. Dr. Toro has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate excellence in mathematics, research, teaching, and outreach. She has demonstrated to us all a top-notch commitment to expanding access to mathematics for all groups, including underrepresented groups, through her service on national committees and her leadership on the Latinx in the Mathematical Sciences Conferences. She will talk to us today about the geometry of measures. Dr. Toro, I thank you for your impact as a mathematical leader. You have supported and inspired the work of many colleagues and students from around the world. We are very pleased to recognize your achievements and have you as our 2023 Etta Zuber Faulkner Lecture. Thank you. And I, I was told to present the certificate at the beginning so I don't forget. <laughs> so we have a certificate here that um, has a title of her presentation in her honor and probably I, I hope this is the right size. If it's not, you can get, go to the exhibit hall and get a different one. <laughs> we also have, um, AWM has t-shirts that has names of mathematicians on them. The first one um, named here is Faulkner. So I present Perfect. both a certificate and a t-shirt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that it's an incredible honor to be standing here today. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. Nope. <laughs> and um, given the circumstances, I wanted to start with something that something slightly different. Um, so I would like to say that I'm aware that in dozens of state legislatures um, recently, bills have been proposed and passed that have negatively impacted um, people in the communities, including fellow mathematicians, families, friends, school children, and beyond. Not everyone has the option, the opportunity, or the desire to leave their home state under such circumstances, nor should they have to leave their state to feel safe. So I, wanna, I want the members of the community in Florida and beyond to know that I stand with them, that I am listening and working with and for them to make the mathematics community a welcoming place for all. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's start again. It's an incredible honor and I have to say that um, I wouldn't be standing here today if it was not for the support of a very important person who really 
um, was a champion of me getting this award. So Ellen, Ellen, thank you very much. And I don't know if she's here, but. Okay, so let me start by, um, so I wasn't sure whether Talita was gonna do the introduction to Dr. Falconer or not, but let me just um, show a picture of her. And this is a quote that uh, resonates with me. I have devoted my entire life to increasing the number of highly qualified African-American in mathematics and mathematics-related careers. High expectation, the building of self-confidence, and the creation of a nurturing environment have been essential components for the success of these students. And I think could not have been better said. OK, so what is this talk about? Um, you know how when you go to a math talk, you often, um, the talk is about the success of the person standing there and some of their collaborators. So all of my collaborators, this is the story of a failure. OK, so, and of course, there's some. So what happens when you undertake a big thing, you fall, it doesn't work, and how do you get some pieces and how you open new ground? OK, so this is not for the flashy theorems for everything that's around. It's, um, it's not just you're going to go see the Mona Lisa, you're going to see the other paintings in the museum. OK, so um, table of contents. I, this is my new format. It says that. What's geometric measure theory? I know some of you know what it is. Others don't have an idea. So I am going to introduce the subject. So one of the things I hope you take away from this is understanding what geometric measure theory is. Then we're going to talk about measures and densities in a round world. Okay? And round is not a technical term. This is round. And then, but you'll see what it means. And then we're going to talk about measures and densities in other norm spaces. Okay. Um, so what's geometric measure theory? I'm going to start by some pictures. So here are the pictures. So it's fair to say that geometric measure theory is the mathematical field that puts in contact all of these shapes. How do these shapes? So you're looking at them. I mean, I'm sure some of you like some of them, the smooth ones. Others like the other, you know, the more fractally one. Um, I'm sure others of you are thinking, well, that's a vegetable. What is it doing there? <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, there's a meaning. So in some sense, what happens? So the beginning and this is a biased introduction to the subject of geometric measure theory. It's the one that serves the purpose what I want to get. Okay? So first of all, one, I'm being fair. Um, one of the motivations was the plateau problem. So um, it was formulated by Lagrange, but plateau was the person who played with soap. And so what did plateau do? Well, he was interested, and you see two pictures of these, of taking a wire, putting it in soap, and taking something out. And what you're interested in is what's the, in some sense, the smallest area that spans a given boundary. Okay? And you realize from the two pictures with a the boundary there that things can look very different. Some can be very smooth. Others are not as smooth. They're smooth and not. But you need a theory to be able to describe these. Um, you might be thinking it's strange that she put the very smooth pictures on the top and the very non-smooth pictures on the bottom. How can there be a theory that encompasses both? Well, that's what geometric measure theory does. We're not going to dwell on the second set of pictures. If these were to talk about PDEs, I would talk about that, but we're not. But I like those pictures. And they all fit under the same umbrella. OK, so the plateau problem was one of the motivations for geometric measure theory. In fact, it's a very in, if you think of a wired, what a true wire looks like, a wired, and you think of the problem in R3 in space, actually, that was solved by Douglas Arredo in 1936 and was, um, they won the first Fields Medal for this discovery. So it was an important discovery at the time. It took a long time for the next thing, the next results to come, because among other things, there were the questions of what does it mean to be a boundary in higher dimensions? 
or you know, having a surface at the boundary. Not everything is a boundary. Well, with the wire, you can see what is a boundary and what is not. OK, so that's one possible introduction. Now we're going to go, well, either back or forth. We're going to go to Besikovich. And I'm going to talk about the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So my only assumption for this talk was that hopefully most people have taken an analysis class of some sort. And you know what Lebesgue measure is, Lebesgue on the line. And um, what the Lebesgue differentiation theorem tells you that if you have a set in R and it has positive measure, the density, which is this thing written there, is, um, is 1. Okay? So what Besikovich, and so this is the line, and what Besikovich asked himself at the beginning of the 20th century was, what happens if I am in R2 and I have a set that somehow, and he called that the linear length, so he was generalizing the measure of length, is what Hausdorff um, at the time called the Hausdorff measure. What happens if this measure of length, when I look, so I have my set, and I'm going to put another, uh, I have my set, and when I look at my set and I look very nearby with respect to the ball and enlarge, it starts looking like a line in this sense. What does that mean? So it means this. So H1 is the house of measure. It means a generalized length. That's not his terminology. It's the modern terminology. And he assumed, let's imagine that we have a set with this limit, the limit of the set intersection a ball, a round ball, divided by 2R goes to 1 as R goes to 0. What can you say about this set? And what he was able to say is that this set is, um, is included in a countable union of C1 curves, and I just realized this, up to a set of measure 0. And if you don't know exactly what the set of measure 0 is, just forget it, it doesn't matter. The key point is that basically all the the set is a countable union of C1 curves. Okay. Okay, so, and this, so I'm going to give you, so the questions that came up immediately. So that was the work from 1928 to 1938. The first question is, is the converse true? So what does that mean? If I have a countable union of C1 curves, is it true that this quantity goes to 1? So in greater generality, in any dimension, Feather answered this in 1947. The answer is yes. And then what's happening in higher dimensions? Because what Basikovich did was n equals u word in R, e was in R2, so m was 2, n was 1. What happens, imagine that you have a set with this property. So is the limit, and I will give uh, this ratio in a minute uh, a name, so I stop not mentioning because it's too long, is the limit at R goes to 0 of these quantities 1. Then what can you say about the structure of the set? That was a natural question that came up. And what happens if we res Remove, change Hausdorff measure, which is a generalization of, surf, of surface measure, of volume, by another measure. And then, so this is the history. And when I say the story of a failure is, then when you ask yourself, what happens if these, so these balls here, then I didn't tell you, these balls are all round. But the square, is a ball in a different metric. So what happens if I change my round balls by squares? Or what happens if I change them by some other type of balls? Do I have information? OK? So those are all the questions that come from the previous thing. You're going to say, well, <laughs> good I don't have a conversation with this person for a little sentence. She asks four or five questions at a time. But it's good to stop and ask questions. OK. So, in case that was not a convincing um, answer to what geometric measure theory, here you have a visual. This is concrete, and is and um, I think is one of the few fields of mathematics. So, you know, many fields of mathematics have a name, and then a book comes with that title. 
the field did not have a name until the book came out. So the, the field was named in honor of um, the book. This is a book by Federer, who's considered one of the founding fathers of the field. So hopefully you have an answer. So if your only thing take away is that it's a book, okay. <laughs> okay, so let me now talk about measures and densities in the round world. And first I'm gonna show um, what does it mean. So round means balls in L2. And the question that has motivated all of this work is how does the infinitesimal behavior of a measure on round balls determine the structure of the support? And even if I don't give a correct definition, or if I give you a definition of support that's not the one that's 100% correct, you all have a feeling. It means that's what the measure sees. Okay. So what do I mean by infinitesimal? Uh, properties. Well, let mu be a locally finite measure. So this is a way to measure something. Your tab measure is such a thing, but there's others. If you think of a manifold and you think of the volume, that's another one. But you could put lots of different measures. And you look at this ratio. So this is called the density ratio. It's the measure of the ball of centered x and radius r over omega n r to the n. The omega n means just the measure of the unit ball in um, rn and r to a power n. And if n were not an integer, and I'm planting a seed, um, then omega n will mean something different, but it would be a well-defined number, and you can think of it of one. Okay. Um, so if n equals m, and mu is the Lebesgue measured in Rm, then this quantity is always one, okay? Not interesting. Well, or very interesting, depending on how you look at it. But now we're gonna assume that the limit as r goes to zero of this density ratio exists. So that means the density exists. So what does this mean? This means that, so you have something in space. Sorry, my hands maybe. Um, and then you measure it. So let's imagine we're in space, it looks like that. Let's imagine m is 3, n is 2. You take a round ball of dimension 3. You look at the piece, at, you know, the, we're going to assume that this is the support of the measure. You look at what the measure is doing there. You take smaller and smaller balls. And in some sense, what happens is when you do that, you're doing what you do, um, you know, when you're looking at the phone and you cannot see well, you zoom in, so you're blowing up, and that limit exists. It gives you a number between zero and infinity. It's called the density, and the key question, and so if you realize this is what, you know, um, in the case where mu was a very specific measure, this is what basically is just assume was one. So the question is, well, what happens if this thing exists? And so what can we say about the support of the measure? I'm giving you a definition of support. The support is the collection of points where the measures of all balls are positive uh, for every radius. That's not the same support I'm talking about, but let's not go into those details now. And in particular, is it easy? Is my question easier if I take my measure to be the Hausdorff measure supported on a set? So those were all the questions that came out of Besikovic. I'm gonna show you a table that summarizes everything. Um, the goal of this table is to show that progress went slowly, and, and then I'll explain why it went slowly. So what can you expect? You know, what can you expect to say? Well, you cannot expect to say that um, the support is smooth because if I take two lines, it's going to, you know, it, it's not going to be smooth. But so what's, what's my expectation of nice? The same thing that Besikovic did, okay? So, and that is, I'm going to look, I'm going to say that a set is rectifiable. So a set E in our M is rectifiable and rectifiable if it can be included in a countable union of C1 and dimensional submanifolds up to a set of measures zero, okay? 
And so Federer proof that if n is less than m and these, the set is rectifiable, then this density exists. So in some sense, that's the best thing you can expect. This is for the set. For the measured, it roughly means that the support is rectifiable, OK? Um, don't quote me. That's not 100% right, but you know, but very, very close to right. I mean, it will, it will pass for news without any problem. Um, so here's the table. So the existence of n density implies n rectifiability. So 1938, Besikovich did the case of n equals 1 and m equals to 2. Okay. 1944, big progress. Morse and Randolph were able to do n equals to 1, m equals to 2 for a different measure. Then in 1950, Moore was able to do n equals to 1, m is greater or equal than 2. I'm saying this for 1. What's the difference there so far between 1 and everything else? That if you are in dimension 1, if your set has dimension 1 and you have two points. So what you're trying to prove is that, so parenthesis, C1. When you think of C1, when you're teaching calculus to a student in C1, and you are asking a student to tell you whether the function is C1, what does the student often do? Hopefully, they graph it into something, they blow up. And if the tangent is the line, it's C1. OK? I mean, it's, it's so um, why is the case? n equals to 1 easier because roughly what we're looking at is in the infinitesimal structure, and therefore we're looking at what happens when we blow up, and we're looking at the best approximating line. And if n equals to 1 and you have two points in the set, then the line that joins these two points hopefully approximates the set well. So that's why n equals to 1 was easier. Then Mastrand in 1961 proved the case n equals to 2 and m equals to 3. Matilda, but for the case only when you have Hausdorff measure restricted to E. Matilda in 75 did the general case. And then in 1987, Price did everything. And I know this environment is a little bit difficult to ask question, but the natural question will have been, why did you choose n an integer? And so, you know, I could have defined that density with, with a power s, three quarters, and then, well, because Marston proved around 1961 that n needed to be an integer. Okay. Okay, so the work of Price is a masterpiece, and he introduced many, many ideas. So even though there's not a proof here, um, I want to, to talk a teeny bit about his ideas because they're very important. So what are the ideas? You're looking at the infinitesimal structure. You want to look at the tangents. The first thing he did is he looked at the tangents. So what Price proved is that the tangent measure to a measure, which is something like the derivative is to a function, carries information about in the infinitesimal behavior of the measure. I mean, does it for the function, it does it for the graph, makes sense, it does it for the measure. How do you do compute your tangents? By enlarging, which is a blow up procedure. And what he showed was that every time you blow up, almost every time that you blow up a measure whose density exists, the tangent measure, the tangent object, is an un n uniform measure. And you see below the definition sorry, of an n-uniform measure is a measure such that at every point in the support and at every radius, the measure of the ball is the same thing and is exactly r to the n. And so what Price proceeded to do was to um, study these measures, study their structure, classify them, and that's how he got to his result 100 pages later. Okay, so. So these are the things that you can do in the round world. But when you do the analysis class, they tell you that all metrics and all norms in Rn are equivalent, that you can always put inside any, you know, 
a brown ball inside another ball, and vice versa. So what's the difference? Plus, I am talking about C1. It should not be too different. So what happens in other norm spaces? OK, I want to look at these shapes. Um, so big picture, you have a picture, there's some that you like more, some that you like less. And now our question is, what happens if we change the balls by some of these, of these things? Okay, I, I, I'll have to be a little bit more precise. So let me remind you, all of these, um, all of these shapes are ball in RM, and they are balls in a metric space that is induced by a norm. I remind you the properties of the norm. So there's a triangle in the quality, there's a symmetry, um, and you define the distance as the difference of the norm of the difference of the two points. So the ellipses. The ellipses are balls in the metric that's um, described there, so is sum of ai squared um, xi minus yi squared, and you know those are the coordinates. So the ellipses are balls in those metrics, and these other shapes that you saw, they're LP balls. So they are balls in the round in the LP metrics. Okay. And you see the round, and you have to admit that, you know, for example, for the P equals to 8, it doesn't look as bad. I mean, it's nice, it's smooth, it's everything. The other ones have corners. Okay. So the question is, what of all the theory that I describe in the first part translate to this? Okay. And, and so maybe... A pause because I think sometimes it's good to understand where you were doing. So I had been interested in this question for a while. Then one of my collaborators, you will see, you'll see their names, but you'll also see their pictures because um, one of my collaborators went to visit another collaborator in um, England. It was, I believe, February or March of 2020. Um, my collaborator, who's in my home institution, uh, didn't seem to be in a rush to come back. <laughs> he said, you know, you kind of should hurry. Um, then he came back, and then, you know, half an hour later, we found ourselves completely stuck inside the house. We couldn't do anything. So what you're going to see is what I spent the Thursday mornings between March of 2020 <laughs> And roughly March of 2021, trying to do and failing at doing. But you know, it, it, at least I had company. We were all in line, different time zones. And our question was we focus on these balls and we wanted to understand the same questions. And the same questions was what happens, and you'll see them in a minute, what happens if the density exists? Um, does the number need to be an integer, like what Marstrand had proved? OK, well, I don't know that, but let's assume that I have a uniform measure in these balls. Do I know something? OK, those are all the questions. So it was not a lack of questions. It was a lack of answers. OK, so, um, so the main question which was initial, my initial collaborators were David Bate, um, um, Bobby Wilson, were um, how does the infinitesimal behavior of a measure in the LP balls centered on its support determine the geometric structure of the measure? So what we knew to start with was the work of um, Andrew Laurent that a marshtrap type result for the S density was correct, namely for the case where P equals 1 or infinite. So if, you ha if your ball was either a square, you're going to say, well, the other thing is a square also correct. It's, you know, a square, a turn square. Um, if you're a square and the density exists, then, and the density the S that you choose is a number between 0 and 2. It has to be 1 or 2. And you're going to say, well, that's not, <laughs> doesn't sound like a big deal. It was a lot of work. OK? Um, very recently, actually, the, is not yet on the archive, um, 
Bobby Wilson has proved that in the case where p is between 2 and infinity and mu is exactly hn restricted to a set, then that set is rectifiable. And he had proven um, one of the things we learn is that, you know how you always tell your student, well, take an example, understand it on an example, and then, well, the example was misleading. The examples are misleading because we are very biased, we look at LP, and we always look at these coordinates, and we forget all the others. And so what Bobby has proved is that if the norm is uniformly convex, the theorem is true in this case. But um, OK, so, so we were having trouble with, um, with Wilson and with Bate. And so what we did was, well, what happens if um, we have a uniform measure? So forget the density. Well, no, actually, what happens is the following. We're able to prove that if you have a density, then all your tangents are uniform. So OK, now you have a uniform measure with respect to this fancy, funny ball. What can you say about this measure? Well, the only thing we were able to say is that if P is even, then the support is a real analytic variety. And the words sound impressive, but they're not. This is, an, this is something that Kernheim and Price had proven before, and their same ideas work. But it's really a trick. And I have to say that other um, there's a lot of work on Carnot groups um, about the existence of density, and they're always able to, so in a Carnot group, the balls are not round, and they're only able to do it when they see some of the metrics of the Carnot groups, and it's for exactly the same reason, because, I mean, it's difficult, <laughs> basically, if your P is even, you're the square of something, correct? And so, I mean, when you write, x to the p is x to the q square. It's not, that's the trick. OK, so this is what we were. Um, by now, it was roughly March of 2021, maybe April 2021. So we all, we, we started going out a little bit more. I think we were frustrated that we were getting nowhere. Um, we took a little bit of a pause. And, and then brought somebody, um, somebody else in. So Max Gehring, um, <laughs> sorry, Max Gehring was visiting us, got COVID. I mean, it's finally we we're going to see in person, got COVID, so we only saw each other in Zoom um, while we were there. But basically what we said, OK, so what happens? We're not able to do it for the LP balls. What happens if we do it for metrics where there are the ellipses? So that was the first thing. And then we notice that actually something else happened. We don't, it doesn't need to be, because um, it doesn't need to be the same ellipse. The ellipse can change with the point where you, where you are. As long as, so if you have a measure, so these B, um, lambda xr is, you should think of an ellipse. Is the ellipse centered in that x there? I'm sorry, should be an a. The, so it should say b lambda ar, sorry about the typo, is the ellipse centered at a that is obtained from deforming your round ball by lambda a, which is an invertible matrix. Okay? I am not putting any conditions on the smallest eigenvalue. I'm just saying that is an invertible matrix. And if I look at the density that I obtain um, this way, the limit as r goes to 0 of the measure of this set over r to the n, r to the, sorry, do I have an n or an m? So that's what it should say an n there. Wow. I'm sorry. Then the measure is n rectifiable. Okay? So the same result as the before. So, so it's interesting because it's not even a, a metric. I mean, it tells you you can do these shapes however you want. But on the other hand, they're 
their ellipses. And so you might tell me, but an ellipse, you know, I'm not putting any constraints. So I'm saying that at some points my ellipses can be long and thin, and at other times it can be really round and I'm not, nevertheless I get rectifiability. And now on the other hand, when I take these balls that look like, uh, you know, like almost a rounded square, I cannot do it. And I agree with you if you're saying, what's she talking about? How can she not, she can do the long thin, um, ellipses and not the round balls, that's the question we ask ourselves all the time. The reason why it's taking so long to put this paper out is because we believe we should be able to do it, but no, and we understand where the difficulties are. But so, in some sense, when I said this is a story of a failure, it is, here is what we wanted to do, I've told you what we wanted to do, this is what we're really able to do. We're also able, there are, for those of you who are in the area, there are other questions around these. For example, if you have a measure, so if you're lost here, don't worry, in two, se in two minutes you'll be back. Um, if you have a measure whose principal values exist with respect to round balls, you know, from um, Matila and Price that the, the support is rectifiable, well, we're able to do something similar for these cases. So, and there are several ways to do these. We also look at the tangent measures, but they're all purely measure theoretic ways of doing these. What are we working on? Trying to understand what happens when we have the other balls. Okay, so here are my collaborators. The person feeding the squirrel is David Bay, um, who, was in in, who is in England and um, was our companion really for the year of COVID. In the middle is Max Gehring, the new person who walked in, and then have Bobby Wilson, my um, colleague at the University of Washington. So let me, the te what's the takeaway? Well, the geometric measure theory, I don't put that, is a book and that uh, the infinitesimal properties of a measure in Euclidean space with a non-smooth Riemannian metric determine the structure of its support. And the question of what happens in Euclidean space with the LP metric poses very interesting challenges. And those are the ones we're working on. So let me say thank you very much, and I will really appreciate a couple of questions. Thanks. I left time for questions on purpose. <laughs> Just wondering if there's, uh, with the different kinds of LP spaces, if there's any duality properties that, that you know. Yes, and so, yes, yeah. so we were trying to do it for P greater or equal than two because it's clear that uniform convexity plays a role. Where, the duality, you, you nailed it. What's the difference between the LP spaces? L2, it is on dual, okay? And so when you look at the tangents in a, um, in a Banach space sense, this is a finite dimensional Banach space, when you look at the tangent, um, of course, L2 is its on dual, but um, when you look at the tangents for LP, is LP, you know, it's, it's the other one, is LP star, which happens to be less than two, and somehow you end up getting information about the dual, and rather than the support of the measure and this twisted measure. And even if you were able, so I'm gonna give you an example, let's, um, even if you were able to prove that, um, that a space is a line, then when you look at its, and let's see, so this is a line, you look at x cubed, which is something that comes a lot when you're looking at L4, <laughs> sorry. Then now the, the image is not a line anymore, and so you're not able to, the information that you're able to get from the tangent in the round balls is, is very useful because you get that the tangent, the dual is a line, but if the dual of something in L4 is a line, that 
that doesn't tell you that L4 is a line, the thing in L4 is a line. I mean, uh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, trying to understand the, I come from a background where we're familiar with uh, one measure being absolutely continuous with respect to another or mutually singular. And when you uh, just take the round case you were looking at, the ball is round, um, how, do, how does one understand um, the density, of the tangent? Uh, that you describe for a measure, a uh, tangent measure in relation to a measure. Is it related somehow Absolutely. to, yeah. Is Absol it related somehow to this um, notion of absolute continuity or, or not? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so you observe and, so the first thing is the density exists the measured mu that you have is absolutely continuous with respect to the HN, the, the, if I have an RN, and I have the measure of the ball of center X and radius R over R to the N. If that number exists as positive and finite, then the measure mu is absolutely continuous with respect to a measure that is HN support okay. somewhere. Now, your question about how do you understand the tangent. So in the following way, when you have this measure, the fact that that exists at almost every point, one of the things you prove is that the support, the set, corresponds to a blow up, goes up to a plane. But I'm you sorry, are blowing could you up. Could you repeat that again? Could you repeat what you just said? Yeah, goes sorry, up let me a... get rid of this, yeah. Um, when the density exists, the set where the measure is supported, when you blow up, so when you yeah. enlarge and enlarge, at almost all point, not at all, but at almost all point, it goes to a plane. But oh. what you should tell me is, but you're blowing up a measure. So when you blow up a measure, you should go to a measure rather than to a set. And you are correct. So the density that is, and I will refer back to your question in a second, the density is telling you you blow up to a plane and the measure is the density, that number, multiply by your measure, okay? When two measures are absolutely continuous, mutually absolutely continuous, you have the radon nicodym theorem. So what this is telling you is that the derivative by the radon nicodym Theorem is the coefficient that determines what your measure is in that way. Anything else? I have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right here, I'll be the volunteer. Excellent lecture, doctor. Um, with all the mathematical background and knowledge that you have and, and have exemplified on your slides and your background, your, your portfolio, personal portfolio, have you can take it to the one step further and how we can, have you been responsible or a part of the, uh, oh, of taking all the accumulation of all your mathematical background and for, of any new products for the average consumer out there that you've been a part of? Have I been? Well, in, other, in other words, all the, all the mathematical stuff here, the circles, this and that, the reductions of this then, have you been a part by any companies for the, of any products that you can actually uh, relay or s somehow make it more real world? Not possibly, so I'm gonna say two things. Not yeah. possibly, in the, and I'm assuming that you're imagining something, so right. I'm not sure in the way you're imagining, but I have to, um, so. Example, I have to uh, announce one of the ways my, right. what I know mathematically has, uh, right. so I'm the, I'm the co-author of a children's book that will be launching as a part right. of a um, collection to encourage kids to get into STEM. Is it, is it, well, my, my point is, is like when the design of bottles go, like when they make a ketchup bottle, uh -huh. or when they make a mayonnaise bottle, right here you go, right there you, you know, I mean, has anybody ever, or you've ever been a part in contact to how to make things better? or like, uh, you know, volume-wise and density-wise or anything like that? 
No, not in that, those practical terms. I well, think making things better, yes, but not in terms of containers. Excellent lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.